During our excursus of natural theology, we've looked at various arguments for God's existence. On the other hand, there needs to be considered arguments against God's existence as well. Um, it's not enough simply that there be good arguments to believe that God exists. Uh, we want to know where the balance of the evidence lies. Are there equally good arguments for atheism on the other side of the scale that counterbalance these arguments or perhaps tip the balance in the other direction? So during this section we want to look at arguments against God's existence. Now as a matter of fact there really aren't very many arguments against God's existence quite frankly. I find that the atheist's main complaint is just that there isn't any evidence for God's existence. He complains that there's no reason to believe that God exists and so he is content to simply remain in unbelief. But you see, if you've got these arguments that we've just uh, surveyed over the last several months memorized and ready to share, then that objection won't apply to you. And frankly, unbelievers, I find, are not very used to running into Christians who are able to offer good arguments for the hope that is in them. When the unbeliever says to you, there's no evidence that God exists, you can stop him dead in the tracks by looking at him with a surprised uh, expression on your face and saying, is that what you think? Why, I can think of at least five arguments for God's existence. And at that point, he's got to say, yeah, like what? And then you're off and running, and you can be share, able to share your arguments with him. So that rather than a conversation stopper, his challenge actually becomes a conversation starter to begin to share reasons to believe in God. And I think you'll find that unbelievers are, generally speaking, so ill-equipped to deal with these issues that in response to the arguments for God's existence that you share, they tend to just repeat themselves. Well, that's no evidence that God exists. One blogger characterized my debate with the British atheist uh, Lewis Wolpert in Central Hall, London, in the following way. Wolpert, there's no evidence for God's existence. Craig, there is evidence for God's existence, and here it is, one, two, three, four. Wolpert, there's no evidence for God's existence. Craig, there is evidence for God's existence, and here it is, one, two, three, four. Wolpert, there's no evidence for God's existence. Now sadly, this characterization was not too far off the mark. Sometimes it seems like non-believers are just deaf. They've simply been taught to repeat the slogan, there's no evidence for God's existence. Uh, apparently thinking that by saying it over and over again, that somehow makes it true. I think that for many people, it's just uh, an excuse for intellectual laziness and a lack of engagement. It's just a way of saying, I'm not convinced by your arguments. But if the unbeliever is not convinced, then I think the appropriate response to him is to say politely, well, uh, you apparently don't find my arguments convincing. So you must think that some of my premises are false. So which premise of the argument do you reject and why? Force them to engage with the argument. One atheist that I was talking to said at that point, well, I reject all of them. And I said, surely you don't reject all of them. Do you reject the premise that the universe exists, uh, which is one of the premises in the Leibnizian argument, or that the fine-tuning of the universe is due to physical necessity, chance, or design, which just lists the alternatives. And he recognized at that point that his remark had been careless, and we then began to have a good conversation. Try to get the unbeliever to engage with your specific premises. And I think all of this underscores the importance of having these arguments memorized. Uh, doing so will help you to stay on track in a conversation uh, with an unbeliever. So in response to your question, uh, which premise do you reject and why, 
the unbeliever is apt to say something like, well, I think that uh, religion is just all in your head, or religion has done more harm than good uh, to society than anything else. But don't allow him to get you distracted, to get you off track. Say, I understand, that's how you feel. But you said there's no evidence for God's existence. And now I've shared an argument. So what I want to know is which premise do you reject and why? Stay focused on the arguments and the premises um, and don't be distracted. Try to get him to engage. And eventually you may get to the point where you can say to him, you know, I, I don't think that you really are rejecting God because of lack of evidence. I sense a deeper emotional rejection of God that's going on there. What's the real reason that you reject God? And at that point, you've moved beyond mere apologetics into real counseling and, and personal engagement with the unbeliever. My point is that having a few arguments memorized uh, is a tremendous tool in dealing with unbelievers, and it will completely pull the rug out from under the unbeliever's main reason for his unbelief, namely the claim that there's no evidence for God's existence. And I, in fact, I have found in personal witnessing experiences that just having a list of the arguments to share with the unbeliever may often be enough. If he says there's no evidence for God's existence, you can say, well, I can think of, of five reasons to think God exists. God is the best explanation why anything at all exists rather than nothing. God is the best explanation of the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation for the existence of objective moral values and duties in the world. And the very possibility of God's existence implies that God exists. And very often, just sharing that list with the unbeliever will be so overwhelming that it will be enough to answer his objection that there's no evidence for God's existence. Now, of course, if he wants to hear more, then you can go into the arguments individually. But the point is that if you are prepared, you will be able to easily meet the main objection that unbelievers offer to the existence of God, namely this slogan, there's no evidence for God's existence. Any comment about that first point? before we move to consider specific objections. Uh, yes, just in my experiences of dealing with um, argumentation with atheists, do you often times, when they bring up no evidence, do you feel like they're equivocating with the term proof? Because I've always given out a lot of these evidence they speak of with you know, yeah. phys physical things like fine-tuning the universe, and then it's like they always dismiss it, and the next word that comes out of their mouth, well, that doesn't prove God. I'm like, that's okay. not what I'm trying to get at, though. That's <laughs> a very good point. Uh, and I, the way I put the objection is there's no evidence yeah. for God's existence. I didn't use the word proof. Yeah. I do think you're quite right that people, when they use the word proof, they're thinking of 100% certainty. And as you indicated, there's no reason that we should set the bar that high for success in natural theology. Um, you are saying there's good evidence for God that on balance it's more probable than not that God exists and there's a powerful cumulative case and whether that amounts to a proof is uh, not really germane. And so I think that here that sort of intellectual modesty is, is very attractive. You're not trying to prove too much. Um, I think what you try to do is set the bar low and then exceed it as high as you can rather than set the bar high and then struggle to get over it. But you're, you're quite right in saying that you may need to explain to the unbeliever that you're not offering uh, proofs that compel assent. Yes, Kevin? Just in response to that, if a person says well, you haven't proven that God does exist, wouldn't you turn that around and say, but you haven't proven that God doesn't exist? Um, so if this is an atheist, it's like you have 100% certainty that God doesn't exist, so right. show me what this 
absolute proof is, and then I'll believe it if yes. that's your criteria. Right. And we'll talk some more about that. Is there a differential burden of proof here between the theist and the non-theist? Um, and we'll see that the atheist will very often claim that he doesn't have a burden of proof to bear. He need prove nothing, that the burden of proof lies all on the shoulders of the theist. And I think Kevin is quite right in saying that that uh, is a mistake. There is no differential version of uh, a burden of proof. Both are making truth claims um, that would need to be justified if we're to believe in them. Okay, any other comment on this first point about no evidence? Uh, if the atheist says that by atheism they mean a form of agnosticism or not? Yes, you, I'll say something about that in just a few minutes. Uh, about the attempt on the contemporary scene to redefine atheism so as to shirk any burden of proof, it becomes equivalent to agnosticism. So I'll hang on to that point. Well, I'd like to turn then first to epistemological objections to the existence of God, which is on one of your handouts. And I'll just go through these fairly quickly um, because I don't think that these are uh, very substantive objections on the contemporary scene. The first uh, epistemological objection is verificationism. Verificationism was a philosophy that was very dominant in the United States and Britain during the 1930s and 40s. And basically what the verificationists said is that any statement in order to be meaningful must be capable of being empirically verified. If a statement cannot be verified through the five senses in some way, then it is a meaningless statement. Now, notice that this is a criterion of meaning. It is not a truth test. The verificationists weren't saying in order to be a good scientific theory or in order to be a good explanation, you need to have some evidence that would verify your explanation or your theory. I think few scientists would disagree that a good theory would be one that enjoys empirical verification. But the verificationists were much more radical in that. They're, they're offering a criterion of meaning. They're saying that if a statement cannot be empirically verified, then it is literally meaningless. Now, in saying that these statements are meaningless, they didn't mean that the statement is just like, say, gargling, just gibberish. Rather, what they meant was that statements which are not verifiable don't make any factual assertion. They don't make any factual claim. They may be meaningful in a grammatical sense. You can understand the claim. It's not just gibberish. But these claims don't make any factual assertion. To give an analogy, questions and commands are meaningful in the sense that we understand them grammatically. If someone asks you, is Publix open today, you understand the meaning of that question. Or if someone says to you, shut the door, you understand the meaning of that command. But those Questions and commands don't make any factual assertions. Questions are not true or false. Commands are not true or false because they're not factual assertions. So they're meaningful in a grammatical sense, but questions and commands are not the sort of things that are true or false. They are not factual assertions. And in the same way, the verification has said that statements about God don't make any factual assertion, and therefore it's neither true nor false. Now, don't misunderstand me. They're, they're not claiming that statements about God are disguised questions or disguised commands. I'm just using questions and commands as illustrations of statements that are grammatically meaningful but make no factual assertion. And in the same way, they would say that statements about God though grammatically meaningful, express no fact. They make no factual claim, and therefore they are neither true nor false. So 
um, even atheism on this view is meaningless because atheism would say God does not exist and that's a meaningless statement it makes no factual claim just as the statement God does exist makes no factual claim so on verificationism statements about God don't even have the dignity of being false they are neither true nor false they just don't make any sort of factual claim now verificationism succumbed to criticism during the second half of the 20th century in fact it's been said I think rightly so that the most important philosophical development of the 20th century was the collapse of verificationism which had so dominated the first half of the 20th century and there were basically two uh, criticisms that led to the demise of verificationism first the principle was too restrictive to be plausible if the verification principle were true that only empirically verifiable statements uh, are meaningful this would force you to trash not only theological statements but vast vast ranges of human discourse uh, so that much of what we say and um, and act on would turn out to be meaningless metaphysical truths about the existence of the external world aesthetic truths about uh, beauty and ugliness mathematical and logical truths cannot be verified by empirical matters uh, and as it turned out even scientific truths are often not verifiable so that the verification principle would undermine science itself which was the sacred cow of the verificationist if you want an example of this um, consider the principle uh, in the special theory of relativity that light has a constant one-way velocity it is a postulate of Einstein's special theory of relativity that the one-way velocity of light is constant but that's non verifiable all we can measure is the round trip velocity of light as light goes out is reflected back and then returns to the source and we can measure that round trip velocity of light it is always constant but Einstein's theory presupposes that the one-way velocity of light from A to B is constant and that's non verifiable theoretically light could go out at one speed and come back at another speed and at varying speeds just so long as the round trip velocity is constant so the theory is based upon a postulate which is non verifiable and this is common in science so that verificationism would actually destroy science which um, was as I say for the verificationists the uh, sacred cow that they wanted to uh, support secondly though not only was the criterion too restrictive but it turned out to be self-refuting it's self-refuting just ask yourself is the statement quote only statements that are empirically verifiable are meaningful end quote is that statement empirically verifiable well no it, it's uh, just an arbitrary definition uh, and therefore one that we're at liberty to reject so by its own light the verification principle being non verifiable is meaningless it makes no factual claim whatsoever and therefore it has no claim upon us and therefore during the second half of the 20th century verificationism simply collapsed and this resulted in a renaissance of metaphysics and uh, ethics and all of the traditional questions of philosophy including the renaissance in Christian philosophy that is ongoing in the Anglo-American world sadly however I find that this kind of verificationism still has a long lingering shadow uh, especially over older uh, scientists who were educated during the verificationist era and that is often sadly passed on to their students so you will often find this kind of verificationist uh, mentality 
um, on the internet and among people, especially in the science, sciences, who think that um, theology or claims about God are just meaningless because they're not empirically verifiable. And I can't emphasize too strongly that this kind of verificationism is universally rejected today by philosophers, uh, both epistemologists and philosophers of science, uh, because of the reasons that I mentioned. So uh, if you run into this, you need to simply share with your unbelieving friend the reasons why verificationism is untenable and that he is adopting a position that is obsolete and universally rejected among uh, philosophers of knowledge and of science. Any comment uh, about verificationism? I just, want to make a com I just want to make a comment. I thought it was amusing how in your debate with Hector Avalos on the resurrection of Jesus, there's a part where he brings up something very similar to this. Like, well, if you can't see it, touch it, or taste it, you know, in this case, miracles or God, it's meaningless. And when you pointed out that it was self-refuting, he replied, well, actually, no, it's, it's self-affirming. Uh, yeah, yeah. It it is. It, it's amazing how often you encounter this. Um, I'm sure many of you have in your own witnessing situations. Yes, back here. In, high, in theoretical physics, there are all kinds of entities postulated because of their explanatory value, even though we don't have any direct access to them empirically. Um, but these are theoretical entities that, if they exist, they help explain the things that we do experience. And many of the arguments for God's existence are of that nature, that God um, is like a theoretical entity in physics, uh, the existence of which will explain plausibly empirical data that we do experience, like the fine-tuning of the universe, for example, or the beginning of the universe. So that's a nice analogy, I think, between these high-level theoretical entities and, and God. Okay. The questioner brings out a nice analogy between these non-empirically detectable theoretical entities in physics, like, for example, certain subatomic particles, which, if they exist, will explain very plausibly empirical evidence that we do experience. And so these theoretical entities may not be directly empirically accessible, but they are indirectly uh, posited because of their explanatory value in explaining the things that we can access empirically. And that's rather analogous to God, I think. Bruce. Sorry, I was on once already. But <laughs> anyway, even beyond on, this, on the cosmological side that you're re referring to, there's a number of the theorists have admitted that they have theories about string and right. uh, concepts that uh, allow certain mathematical formulas to come out, but they admit we don't know that this corresponds to anything that, that's happening in the real world. So uh, a lot of these uh, cosmo some, some of these cosmological theories are just are just theories that uh, set apart that, f that uh, allow certain mathematical formulas to work, but, but not necessarily correspond to anything that is Fair really enough. happening. That, that would be an instrumentalist interpretation of these theories, and especially when you have empirically equivalent theories that have different theoretical entities, 
then you may not know which one is actually true. But here again, I want to emphasize very strongly, the verificationist was not talking about a test for the truth of the theories. He was talking about whether they're meaningful. And I think we would agree that whether you're a string theorist or a particle theorist, and, and, and you don't know which one is correct, say, nevertheless, they're making meaningful claims. Those are meaningful accounts, even if we don't know which one is true, if, if either. So again, be sure not to make the confusion between verification as a test for truth and verification as a criterion for meaning. What we're talking about here is uh, a criterion for meaning. Yes? So would the opposite of verificationism be strict constructivism, where nothing exists until you've thought it up? I, 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 that's not clear to me. Um, I mean, why wouldn't a sort of um, objectivism be right, that there is objective meaning mm -hmm. and that it's not tied to empirical verification? I, I'm not sure there is a sort of opposite to verificationism. If verificationism is false, mm -hmm. there could be probably a, a, a variety of alternatives to it. I've noticed that when you get into the empirical evidence or whatever that atheists are requiring, it's, it's funny that it usually breaks down to they want to see something huge out of God, like him parting the clouds and saying, here I am, or that Jesus would just have walked off the cross and said, look, you can't crucify me, or just they, they demand from their own like kind of a worldly theology that God make a big spectacle out of something in the, in the hiddenness or humility uh, of, of the way that God does things is it's just it's untenable it seems to be to atheists so regardless of however many arguments that we come up with if we can't show them some kind of huge spectacle that they reject it and they say they're rejecting it because it's not empirical but what they really mean is that they want a spectacle yeah right that's kind of related to the hiddenness of God that we'll talk about later um, why doesn't God appear to each person as a 300-foot Jesus or something, or write his name in the heavens. Why doesn't he do these sort of spectacular miracles rather than this kind of indirect evidence that requires you to seek and to, to search and to look for God? We'll talk about that a little bit later. I think God can have good reasons for not making his existence just as plain as the nose on your face. But you're quite right, again, in, in, uh, that, that many skeptics are demanding that God give them the kind of evidence they want to see, rather than asking themselves, has God given evidence sufficient for his existence to, to make belief in God rational uh, or justified? And, and that's the real question, not whether it meets my uh, desires. Taiwan? Craig, um, all human endeavor is to discover. And we are to discover the empirical uh, data and, and the creator and discovery, discoverers are there and, and all through human history are verifying there's some design in place for us to discover. Okay. So um, doesn't that uh, doesn't that establish the the very verify in uh, effect of um, the design? Now, if I understand the question right, Taiwan, again, you're dealing with verification and truth yes. that. In order to believe a theory is true, you need to have some sort of verification of it, some evidence for it. And that's not the issue here. The, the verificationists weren't claiming there is inadequate evidence for God's existence. What they're saying is that it is meaningless to claim that God exists because there's no empirical evidence for or against his existence. So atheism, as I say, is as meaningless as 
theism is on this view. It's a criterion of meaning, not a criterion of truth or of rationality. And I, it's this criterion of meaning that has collapsed. Um, I understand. And claims I, can be meaningful even if they're not verifiable. So they twist, I, I, what I'm trying to say is they twist that verification uh, into their Oh, I bent. see. Yes. Yes, I, I think that would be fair to say. Because yes. certainly verification is very important in truth-seeking. Mm -hmm. That you want to find a theory or a view of the world that fits the facts of experience, whatever they might be. Um, and they have twisted that. Mm -hmm claim into a claim about the meaning mm -hmm. of statements, which is, is, as I say, far too restrictive to be plausible and in the end self-refuting. Well, let me uh, say by way of uh, conclusion today uh, that verificationism has been universally rejected by philosophers of science and, and philosophers who are epistemologists, and therefore we needn't be worried about it. In light of this, um, many atheists have argued for the presumption of atheism instead. That is to say that atheism is a kind of default position. That until and unless you have evidence for God's existence, then you should believe that God does not exist. Atheism is a sort of default position, and it's that uh, position or that argument that we'll take up next Sunday when we meet. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father, as we go into this week now, we would pray for your filling of your spirit, your guidance, your direction. Help us to meet every obstacle, Lord, that might come across our path with equanimity and with confidence in your love for us and in your strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.